Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mark's Backyard Birds. Tonight, we are talking about one of the most popular birds in North America. Probably in my world of bird watching, I called them click birds. And that is a bird that when somebody sees it for the first time, is so inspirational that it really charges them and it, it makes them want to start bird watching or wants to learn more about birds learn click birds I, everybody has one in their life well I, I, over the years more people probably have said the pileated woodpecker uh than any other uh, that i can think of so we're gonna learn a lot about the pileated tonight uh first off i am going to start with that pronunciation how do you say the name is it pileated or pileated. Okay. Uh, I think the truth is both are correct. Both can, you're okay if you say you don't one of them, but I'll tell you from a scientific standpoint, the crest on that bird is known as a pileum. So I have always called it pileated because of the pileum, which is the scientific name of that crest. Now I was told once several years ago by a bird watcher whose wife was a linguist expert, and she said, because of the rules of phonetics, whatever, that it uh, should be pileated. Um, I have been around thousands and thousands upon thousands of people <laughs> and, uh, and heard it uh, said both ways. So whichever one is correct, I'm going to say pileated all the way through this program. So uh, I, I hope that's okay with you. So first off, why is this bird so popular. Why is it, it? Well, part of it is because it isn't that common. You don't get to see them all the time. And when you do get to see them, they're so large and impressive. I mean, the colors are striking the black and the white and the red. And and when they fly, they, they, you know, they're about the size of a crow, you know, which is a pretty good sized bird, but they are, they're much more colorful than a crow. And when you do see them, so quite often they surprise you. When you're out in the woods, they are birds of big woods, older timber. Um, I'm going to pull up the map. This is from Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And you see that, yes, this bird was uh, or is a a really a bird of the great southern swamps. Uh, that's where it's claim to fame. You know, that's where it used to share certain woodlands with the ivory-billed woodpecker, which we know now is extinct. But the pileated was persecuted, just like the ivory-billed was. People shot them. People they collected them. They they you know Native Americans believed that they held magical powers because they were so big and and impressive, and they thought you know, that they used their head feathers, things like that. But and then of course hunters uh, shot them, and 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 so they are today. They are still quite secretive because of that. Just like a crow, quite often, well, you know, they don't let you get close. They fly away quite because for years and years and years, they were shot at and, uh, and shot and killed. So today, the pileated is, I'm not going to, he is, it is not rare. Let's get there, right? Do you know that's a part of the name of the program tonight? No, they aren't rare. They're actually fairly common. Uh, and are they endangered? No, they're considered um, a bird of least concern uh, when it comes to endangered or threatened. No, there are plenty of them out there. It's just that we don't see them very often. Part of it is because of habitat. And part of it is because of their being elusive. And when you do see them a lot of time, and I want to get this on a bigger scale here so you can see it better, you see them in flight. You see them coming flying across the road in front of you. And at first glance, you may think that they're a crow. Uh, but when you do finally catch the right sun angle, you see all that white under the wing and maybe the white in the face. And you realize this isn't a crow. This, this is a, the pileated. Uh, the, the size... Uh, the story I love to tell, and I've told it before, is uh, I worked when I was working at Fort Bragg, now Fort Liberty in North Carolina, out of college. My sister lived close by, and she called me one day at the office, and you know, picked up, and she said, "Mark, there's a woodpecker in my yard, and it's as big as a chicken." And I knew right away what it was because that's the only woodpecker nearly that size. They are so much larger than any other. Flickers are big, but pileaters are much larger than flickers. So they do catch your attention and they're quite large when you see them. So what's the difference in them? Well, I'm going to tell you how to tell male from female. They both have that beautiful red crest, and they, but 
the males have this red malar stripe right off of the bill. Coming back here, it is red there, whereas in the female, there is no red there. It's all black. So when you see them, if you can see them well enough turning, you will see that red for the male and the black for the female. So that's how you tell them apart. Um, they are they're so large, you might not think that many th you know, they would have many predators, and they don't. But the ones that they do have are like large Cooper's hawks. Um, they, you know, the woodpeckers are tend to be vulnerable to the occipiters, the the birds like the Cooper's hawk, and and the and not so much the sharp shin because the sharp shin is quite a bit smaller. But a large female Cooper's hawk and a big northern goshawk, which I did can picture coming up. Well, woodpeckers like pileated are clinging to the side of the tree and they're working around there, and the the. The occipiters, the Cooper's hawks, wait until they are shaded by the tree and they fly and snatch them off the side. And so they they do fall victim to Cooper's hawks. And in this case, and here, the northern goshawk, which will be up in that northern tier. Because in a map, you did, I hope you did notice that they they do go up into the north and across Canada and then back down into California. Part of it is because the Great Plains uh, were a barrier, not enough trees, not enough big old timber that they need out there. Uh, and in the Rocky Mountains, not the type of timber they need. Remember, these birds need big old timber and they need a lot of dead wood in there. So for a, um, a, a population of them to grow in a, an area, they need plenty of dead timber. So you got big old live trees, but you also have to have a lot of old dead trees. So in an area where there's a lot of for, uh, timber management, uh, they cut down, they cut out the dead trees a lot of times, they thin out the trees so that uh, the trees can grow bigger so they can harvest them. And so dead trees are, become a premium for them. So that, again, lessens their their area. So um, but what they do is in the in the breeding season, they, they stay in these big, uh, tracks of timber in our area, uh, Western Bend State Parks, Swope Park, some of the areas of Kansas City that have really big old timber, they have a lot of uh, pileated woodpeckers. And if you learn their call, which is a <laughs> cackling sound, then you realize how frequent they are in some areas. They are I, it, it, you know, especially early in the morning, you hear that cackling call and then you'll see them come flying over the top of the trees and through there, uh, especially in the springtime and the nesting time, where they, they where they stay in these big tracts of timber. Now, into the fall, into winter, they do tend to finger out into lesser quality timber uh, for food. You know, they have to, it, the, the insects get harder to find in the cold weather, the grubs inside the wood uh, that they, they want, um, you, you see them uh, uh, searching out. And I've seen them in my old neighborhood in, in winter before, where, where I have never seen them, I never saw them there in 15 years during the nesting season, but I did see them in there. So your chances are better. Of course, the leaves are off the trees too, which helps you uh, to be able to see them as well. So they'll finger out into these lesser habitat. And they do defend territories, uh, you know, especially in the, the nesting season, they defend, defend their nesting territory, but they do defend winter territories as well, but not as vigorously. So there can be, you know, some invaders in, some interlopers, passers through um, that they tolerate, but not like not in the nesting season. In their nesting territories, they're, they'll vigorously defend it against other male intruders and other female intruders. So, um, and they do only nest once a year, uh, and they do nest in big, uh, either a live tree that has access to the heartwood. In other words, a big limb is broken off and it exposes the heartwood. They can hammer and chisel out a hole there. Um, and the male does most of the excavation of, of the nest uh, sites. And the they lay the eggs, the females lay the eggs, and they share the net, the incubation duties. Um, they, 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 what I understand uh, from the, the experts is that they take about two and a half hour shifts sitting on the eggs. They, they, they equalize that and, and, and back and forth sitting on the egg. And they, when they hatch, of course, they're darling. <laughs> Whenever they, you see them, notice the kind of the shape of that hole. 
is more of an oblong uh, rather than a perfectly round nest. That's very typical of them. And boy, they can hammer a, a dead tree and really chip away at the wood. Um, one of our nicknames for them growing up were stump bumpers. Uh, and that is because you do often find them uh, on the ground where uh, you know there's an old stump and you'll see wood chips flying where they're just hammering away and getting those grubs and that are in there eating away that wood and they also accelerate the decomposition of old wood in the forest which is you know helpful for the ecosystem so they're super impressive they, they you know it, it can't and the other question I get asked a lot is well how can I attract them will they actually use an artificial nest and they will you uh, can build nest boxes for them. This is a, a pileated box with the oblong hole up and down rather than that perfectly round hole. And, they, and we can put a link in uh, in the description so to some uh, size dimensions for you if you wanted to build one. They are incredible birds. And like I said, one of the most popular. No, they are not endangered. They actually, they're pretty, a lot more common than most people realize. Uh, are, they're, they're not even considered rare. They are actually fairly common in certain areas habitat wise. Now the range map, you guys out in the Great Plains and the Rockies, I'm sorry, hopefully you enjoyed the program, but you guys that live in the area where they are, hopefully you learned a few things about them and you enjoyed them. That was a great idea for a program. Thanks for sending that in. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do and ring the bell so you know when I'm on next. If you did, please give us a like, share the program if you will. Until next time, let's talk birds.